Chapter Nineteen, Part Two of An Antarctic Mystery. This is the LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. An Antarctic Mystery by Jules Verne. Chapter Nineteen, Part Two. Land. During the next twenty-four hours, the Halbrane took a south-southwesterly course. Nevertheless, her direction must have been frequently changed and her speed decreased in avoiding the ice. The navigation became very difficult so soon as the schooner headed towards the line of the bergs, which it had to cut obliquely. However, there were none of the packs which blocked up all access to the icebergs on the sixty seventh parallel. The enormous heaps were melting away with majestic slowness. The ice blocks appeared quite new to employ a perfectly accurate expression, and perhaps they had only been formed some days. However, with a height of one hundred and fifty feet, their bulk must have been calculated by millions of tons. West was watching closely in order to avoid collisions, and did not leave the deck even for an instant. Until now Captain Len Guy had always been able to rely upon the indications of the compass, the magnetic pole still hundreds of miles off, had no influence on the compass, its direction being east. The needle remained steady and might be trusted. So, in spite of my conviction, founded, however, on very serious arguments, there was no sign of land, and I was wondering whether it would not be better to steer more to the west, at the risk of removing the halbrane from that extreme point where the meridians of the globe cross each other. Thus the hours went by and I was only allowed forty-eight. It was only too plain that lack of courage prevailed, and that every one was inclined to be insubordinate. Another day and a half I could no longer contend with the general discontent. The schooner must ultimately retrace her course towards the north. The crew were working in silence, while West was giving sharp orders for manoeuvring through the channels, sometimes luffing in order to avoid a collision now bearing away almost square before the wind. Nevertheless, in spite of a close watch, in spite of the skill of the sailors, in spite of the prompt execution of the manoeuvres, dangerous friction against the hull, which left long traces of the ridge of the iceberg, occurred. And, in truth, the bravest could not repress a feeling of terror when thinking that the planking might have given way, and the sea have invaded us. The base of these floating ice mountains was very steep, so that it would have been impossible for us to land upon one. Moreover, we saw no seals, these usually very numerous, where the ice fields abounded, nor even a flock of the screeching penguins, which, on other occasions, the halbrane sent diving by myriads as she passed through them. The birds themselves seemed rarer and wilder. Dread, from which none of us could escape, seemed to come upon us from these desolate and deserted regions. How could we still entertain a hope that the survivors of the Jane had found shelter, and obtained means of existence in those awful solitudes? And if the Halbrane were also shipwrecked, would there remain any evidence of her fate? Since the previous day, from the moment our southern course had been abandoned, to cut the line of the icebergs, a change had taken place in the demeanour of the half-breed nearly always crouched down at the foot of the foremast, looking afar into the boundless space. He only got up in order to lend a hand to some manoeuvre, and without any of his former vigilance or zeal. Not that he had ceased to believe that his comrade of the Jane was still living. That thought never even came into his mind. But he felt by instinct that the traces of poor Pym were not to be recovered by following this course. Sir, he would have said to me, This is not the way, no, this is not the way. And how could I have answered him? Towards seven o'clock in the evening, a rather thick mist arose. This would tend to make the navigation of the schooner difficult and dangerous. The day, with its emotions of anxiety and alternatives, had worn me out. So I returned to my cabin, where I threw myself on my bunk in my clothes. But sleep did not come to me owing to my besetting thoughts. I willingly admit that the constant reading of Edgar Poe's works, and reading them in this place, in which his heroes delighted, 
had exercised an influence on me which I did not fully recognize. Tomorrow the forty-eight hours would be up, the last concession which the crew had made to my entreaties. "'Things are not going as you wish,' the boatswain said to me, just as I was leaving the deck. "'No, certainly not, since land was not to be seen behind the fleet of icebergs. If no sign of a coast appeared between these moving masses, Captain Len Guy would steer north to-morrow. Ah, uh, were I only master of the schooner, if I could have bought it even at the price of all my fortune, if these men had been my slaves to drive by the lash, the Halbrane should never have given up this voyage, even if it led her so far as the point above which flames the southern cross. My mind was quite upset, and teemed with a thousand thoughts, a thousand regrets, a thousand desires. I wanted to get up, but a heavy hand held me down in my bunk, and I longed to leave this cabin where I was struggling against nightmare in my half-sleep, to launch one of the boats of the Halbrane, to jump into it with Dirk Peters, who would not hesitate about following me, and so abandon both of us to the current running south. And, lo, I was doing this in a dream. It is to-morrow. Captain Len Guy has given orders to reverse our course, after a last glance at the horizon. One of the boats is in tow. I warn the half-breed. We creep along without being seen. We cut the painter. Whilst the schooner sails on ahead, we stay astern, and the current carries us off. Thus we should drift on the sea without hindrance. At length our boat stops. Land is there. I see a sort of sphinx surmounting the southern peak. The sea sphinx, I go to him. I question him. He discloses the secrets of these mysterious regions to me. And then the phenomenon, whose reality Arthur Pym asserted, appear around the mystic monster. The certain flickering of vapors, striped with luminous rays, is rent asunder. And it is not a face of superhuman grandeur which arises before my astonished eyes. It is Arthur Pym, fierce guardian of the South Pole, flaunting the ensign of the United States in those high latitudes. Was this dream suddenly interrupted, or was it changed by a freak of my brain? I cannot tell. But I felt as though I had been, suddenly awakened. It seemed as though a change had taken place in the motion of the schooner, which was sliding along the surface of the quiet sea, with a slight list to starboard and yet there was neither rolling nor pitching. Yes, I felt myself carried off, as though my bunk were the car of an air-balloon. I was not mistaken, and I had fallen from dreamland into reality. Crash succeeded crash overhead. I could not account for them. Inside my cabin the partitions deviated from the vertical, in such a way as to make one believe that the halbrane had fallen over on her beam-ends. Almost immediately I was thrown out of my bunk, and barely escaped splitting my skull against the corner of the table. However, I got up again, and, clinging to the edge of the door-frame, I propped myself against the door. At this instant the bulwarks began to crack, and the port side of the ship was torn open. Could there have been a collision between the schooner and one of those gigantic floating masses which West was unable to avoid in the mist? Suddenly loud shouts came from the after-deck, and then screams of terror, in which the maddened voices of the crew joined. At length there came a final crash, and the halbrane remained motionless. I had to crawl along the floor to reach the door and gain the deck. Captain Len Guy, having already left his cabin, dragged himself on his knees, so great was the list to port, and caught on as best as he could. In the forepart of the ship, between the forecastle and the foremast, many heads appeared. Dirk Peters, Hardy, Martin Holt, and Endicott, the latter with his black face quite vacant, were clinging to the starboard shrouds. A man came creeping up to me, because the slope of the deck prevented him from holding himself upright. It was Hurlygurly, working himself along with his hands like a top man on a yard. Stretched out at full length, my feet propped up against the jamb of the door. I held out my hand to the boatswain and helped him, not without difficulty, to hoist himself up near me. "'What is wrong?' I asked. "'A stranding, Mr. Jorling.' "'We are ashore.' "'Ashore presupposes land,' replied the boatswain ironically. 
and so far as land goes, there was never any, except in that rascal Dirk Peters' imagination. But tell me what has happened. We came upon an iceberg in the middle of the fog, and were unable to keep clear of it. An iceberg, Bosun? Yes, an iceberg, which has chosen just now to turn head over heels. In turning, it struck the halbrane and carried it off, just as a battledore catches a shuttlecock. And now here we are, stranded at certainly one hundred feet above the level of the Antarctic Sea. Could one have imagined a more terrible conclusion to the adventurous voyage of the Halbrane? In the middle of these remote regions, our only means of transport had just been snatched from its natural element and carried off by the turn of an iceberg to a height of more than one hundred feet. What a conclusion! To be swallowed up in a polar tempest, to be destroyed in a fight with savages, to be crushed in the ice, such are the dangers to which any ship engaged in the polar seas is exposed. But to think that the Halbrane had been lifted by a floating mountain, just as that mountain was turning over, was stranded, and almost at its summit, no, such a thing seemed quite impossible. I did not know whether we could succeed in letting down the schooner from this height, with the means we had at our disposal. But I did know that Captain Len Guy, the mate, and the older members of the crew, when they had recovered from their first fright, would not give up in despair, no matter how terrible the situation might be. Of that I had no doubt whatsoever. They would all look to the general safety. As for the measures to be taken, no one yet knew anything. A foggy veil, a sort of greyish mist, still hung over the iceberg. Nothing could be seen of its enormous mass, except the narrow craggy cleft in which the schooner was wedged, nor even what place it occupied in the middle of the ice fleet, drifting towards the southeast. Common prudence demanded that we should quit the Halbrane, which might slide down at a sharp shake of the iceberg. Were we even certain that the latter had regained its position on the surface of the sea? Was her stability secure? Should we not be on the lookout for a fresh upheaval? And if the schooner were to fall into the abyss, which of us could extricate himself safe and sound from such a fall, and then from the final plunge into the depths of the ocean? In a few minutes the crew had abandoned the halbrane. Each man sought for refuge on the ice slopes, awaiting the time when the iceberg should be freed from mist. The oblique rays from the sun did not succeed in piercing it, and the red disk could hardly be perceived through the opaque mass. However, we could not distinguish each other at about twelve feet apart. As for the Halbrane, she looked like a confused, blackish mass, standing out sharply against the whiteness of the ice. We had now to ascertain whether any of those who were on the deck at the time of the catastrophe had been thrown over the bulwarks and precipitated into the sea. By Captain Len Guy's orders, all the sailors then present joined the group in which I stood with the mate, the boatswain, Hardy, and Martin Holt. So far, this catastrophe had cost us five men. These were the first since our departure from Kerguelen. But were they to be the last? There was no doubt that these unfortunate fellows had perished, because we called to them in vain, and in vain we sought for them, when the fog abated along the sides of the iceberg, at every place where they might have been able to catch on to a projection. When the disappearance of the five men had been ascertained, we fell into despair. Then we felt more keenly than before the dangers which threatened every expedition to the Antarctic zone. "'What about Hearn?' said a voice. Martin Holt pronounced the name at a moment when there was general silence. Had the sailing-master been crushed to death in the narrow part of the hold, where he was shut up? West rushed towards the schooner, hoisted himself on board by the means of a rope hanging over the bows, and gained the hatch, which gives access to that part of the hold. We waited, silent and motionless, to learn of the fate of Hearn, although the evil spirit of the crew was but little worthy of our pity. And yet, how many of us were then thinking that if we had heeded his advice, and if the schooner had taken the northern course, a whole crew would have not been reduced to take refuge on a drifting ice mountain? I scarcely dared to calculate my own share of the vast responsibility, I who had so vehemently insisted on the prolongation of the voyage. 
At length the mate reappeared on deck, and Hearn followed him. By miracle, neither the bulkheads nor the ribs nor the planking had yielded at the place where the sealing-master was confined. Hearn rejoined his comrades without opening his lips, and we had no further trouble about him. Toward six o'clock in the morning the fog cleared off, owing to a marked fall in the temperature. We had no longer to do with completely frozen vapor, but had to deal with the phenomenon called frost rime, which often occurs in these high latitudes. Captain Len Guy recognized it by the quantity of prismatic threads, the point following the wind, which roughened the light ice-crust, deposited on the sides of the iceberg. Navigators know better than to confound this frost-rime with the hoar-frost of the temperate zones, which only freezes when it has been deposited on the surface of the soil. We were now enabled to estimate the size of the solid mass on which we are clustered like flies on a sugar-loaf, and the schooner, seen from below, looked no bigger than the yawl of a trading-vessel. The iceberg of between three and four hundred fathoms in circumference measured from one hundred and thirty to one hundred and forty feet high. According to all calculations, therefore, its depth would be four or five times greater, and it would consequently weigh millions of tons. This is what had happened. The iceberg, having been melted away at its base by contact with warmer waters, had risen little by little. Its center of gravity had become displaced and its equilibrium could only be re-established by a sudden capsize, which had lifted up the part that had been underneath, above the sea-level. The halbrane caught in this movement was hoisted as by an enormous lever. Numbers of icebergs capsized thus on the polar seas, and form one of the greatest dangers to which approaching vessels are exposed. Our schooner was caught in a hollow on the west side of the iceberg. She listed to starboard, with her stern raised and her bow lowered. We could not help thinking that the slightest shake would cause her to slide along the slope of the iceberg into the sea. The collision had been so violent as to stave in some of the planks of her hull. After the first collision, the galley, situated before the foremast, had broken its fastenings. The door between Captain Len Guy's and the mate's cabins was torn away from the hinges. The top mast and the top gallant mast had come down after the back stays parted, and fresh fractures could plainly be seen as high as the cap of the masthead. Fragments of all kinds, yards, spars, a part of the sails, breakers, cases, hen-coops were probably floating at the foot of the mass and drifting with it. The most alarming part of our situation was the fact that of the two boats belonging to the Halbrane, one had been stove in when we grounded, and the other, the larger of the two was still hanging on by its tackles to the starboard davits. Before anything else was done, this boat had to be put in a safe place, because it might prove our only means of escape. As a result of the first examination, we found that the lower mass had remained in their places, and might be of use if ever we succeeded in releasing the schooner. But how were we to release her from her bed in the ice, and restore her to her natural element? When I found myself with Captain Len Guy, the mate, and the boatswain, I questioned them on this subject. "'I agree with you,' replied West, "'that the operation involves great risks, but since it is indispensable, we will accomplish it. I think it will be necessary to dig out a sort of slide down to the base of the iceberg.' "'And without the delay of a single day,' added Captain Len Guy. "'Do you hear, boatswain?' said Jem West. "'Work begins to-day.' "'I hear, and every one will set himself to the task,' replied Hurley-Gurley. "'If you allow me, I shall just make one observation, Captain. "'What is it? "'Before beginning the work, let us examine the hull, "'and see what the damage is, and whether it can be repaired. "'For what use would it be to launch a ship stripped of her planks, "'which would go to the bottom at once?' "'We complied with the boatswain's just demand. "'The fog having cleared off, a bright sun then illuminated the eastern side of the iceberg, whence the sea was visible round a large part of the horizon. Here the sides of the iceberg showed rugged projections, ledges, shoulders, and even flat instead of smooth surfaces, giving no foothold. However, caution would be necessary in order to avoid the falling of those unbalanced blocks, 
which a single shock might set loose. And, as a matter of fact, during the morning several of these blocks did roll into the sea, with a frightful noise, just like an avalanche. On the whole, the iceberg seemed to be very steady on its new base. So long as the center of gravity was below the level of the water-line, there was no fear of a fresh capsize. I had not yet had an opportunity of speaking to Dirk Peters since the catastrophe. As he had answered to his name, I knew he was not numbered among the victims. At this moment I perceived him standing on a narrow projection, needless to specify the direction in which his eyes were turned. Captain Len Kai, the mate, the boatswain, Hardy, and Marchin Holt, whom I accompanied, went up again towards the schooner, in order to make a minute investigation of the hull. On the starboard side, the operation would be easy enough, because the halbrane had listed to the opposite side. On the port side, we would have to slide along to the keel, as well as we could by scooping out the ice, in order to ensure the inspection of every part of the planking. After an examination which lasted two hours, it was discovered that the damage was of little importance, and could be repaired in short time. Two or three planks were only wrenched away by the collision. In the inside the skin was intact, the ribs not having given way. Our vessel, constructed for the polar seas, had resisted where many others less solidly built would have been dashed to pieces. The rudder had indeed been unshipped, but that could be easily set right. Having finished our inspection inside and outside, we agreed that the damage was less considerable than we feared, and on that subject we became reassured. Reassured, yes, if we could only succeed in getting the schooner afloat again. End of chapter 19, part 2